Just past the Nzima River Junction, Captain A.C.D. Saunders of the King's African Rifles establishes a base of sorts to slow any advance up the river features to attack the Tesevo Railroad Bridge. The site had been chosen by H.E. Frost, an intelligence department officer who had identified this position and related to Major A.A. James. Named Frost's Castle, it was positioned on high ground overlooking the local bush and the crisscross river waves. Not only that, but the river crossings approaches to the north and west were mudflats, difficult and slow to cross. In the area, two separate German attacks had been made and been driven back, or slowed at a more forward position. But now Frost's castle was the most forward position. If a German attack on the Tesevo Bridge was made, the Germans from any direction would have to cross here. Captain Saunders' force included B Company of the 4th King's African Rifles and Captain Isaacson's Somali Scouts, six officers, 215 men, and two machine guns. Despite having been beaten by the British twice, Vorbrick ordered Hauptmann Schultz to occupy the Nyulu Hills. Vorbrick's command staff member, Whale, worried that with heavy German losses, attempts to inflict an attack on the Tesevo River Bridge area, that the German Ascaris would be less effective or simply surrender, and further offensive operations were a mistake. It would take Vorbrick longer to see this wisdom, and Schultz's battered troops were reinforced by 4th Feld Company under Hauptmann Rothert. On the night of the 25th of September, Schultz's column scouts exchanged fire with the British pickets. Captain Saunders hurried to move the last section of British Ascaris and their machine gun into Frost's castle. The next day, the 26th of September, the Germans advanced in line onto Frost's castle. Saunders only reached and deployed the last of his men an hour before the German machine guns began peppering the newly dug British trenches. For the entire day, machine guns roared and the German line attempted to assault the British at various angles. The thorn bushes to the south prevented the Germans from bypassing Frost's castle, and when they emerged from cover, they were immediately fired upon by the British Ascari riflemen. When the German machine guns would find a position and begin firing, the two British machine guns would silence the four German machine guns. As the sun reached its climax, so did the battle, the Germans having suffered losses and unable to find an assault position to charge the British, decided early in the afternoon to retire from combat. To Captain Saunders, it was strange the Germans retired without a general assault, so for the night of the 26th until the 27th of September, the British manned their positions. Only after daylight broke did Saunders send reconnaissance forward. The reconnaissance reported that Germans had retired, but not only that, retreated back to Hemo. Unknown to the British, Hauptmann Schultz had been wounded, so had seven other German Ascaris. German losses were higher, but the Germans left their dead behind, and Saunders didn't record how many were buried that day. The British losses were too wounded. The Germans also abandoned their machine guns and a satchel of German army intelligence. Schultz wouldn't heal and return to duty until 1916. With the offensive commander bedridden, offensive operations wouldn't resume towards Tesevo. The German colonists and Schutzen companies assigned to the area didn't independently attempt to attack the Tesevo bridge. Only after Schultz had been wounded was Vorbrick informed of all the difficulties of the operations that took place. Hauptmann Rothert said the terrain was too difficult and the British defenders too numerous. Hauptmann Rothert refused Vorbrick's orders to make another assault on the 2nd of October. Thus, operations ceased for a time in the Tesevo region. The local British Maasai tribesmen resumed cooperation with the British, offering scouts and bearers. These minor victories were also good press in the papers, boosting British morale.